watch enthusiasts, and welcome to Watch Chronicler Podcast. In today's episode, I'd like to speak about a watch which came out a couple of weeks ago now, which is Omega's Speedmaster Caliber 321, so called Ed White, which is to say a remake of the watch worn for the first NASA spacewalk. And really, the reason why I'd like to speak about this today is because I released an article on this a few weeks ago, in fact, just when it came out on watchchronicler.com, and I would, of course, encourage you to go over there to see the best of the articles, um, and, and direct features about watches, uh, discussions about watches, and so on, which you wouldn't see here on the channel, or indeed on, on any other format you might be listening to this podcast on. But the reason why I'd like to speak about this today is because this Omega has been compared to the Rolex Daytona, or as a watch which Omega's put forth as a competitor to the Rolex Daytona. So I'd like to unpack this, very, this, this quite complex point in today's podcast, and following um, certain points made by, uh, by listeners here on YouTube, I will include some photography to, to illustrate my points, um, to be able to help you through with the, the podcast. But if you want to listen to this in the more traditional sense, head over to Spotify or SoundCloud, or WatchChronicler.com, where you can find this as just an audio format. But if you enjoy the rest of the content on Watch Chronicler, then remember to follow us on Instagram to both see a selection of attractively curated photos, but also to see previews of podcasts, videos and articles, as well as any news to come about events in the possible near future. Now first we have to begin with what this new Ed White Speedmaster actually is. And the Speedmaster is a watch which has been around for virtually as long as the enthusiasm for watches existed. Introduced in the late 50s and 1957, it's been produced in a variety of different iterations, but has always been a very different product to what, uh, what Rolex was offering in their chronograph. Where the Speedmaster was meant to be a racing watch, but then ended up in effect being too good for that and being used for space instead, um, the, the Daytona always remained uh, very much a racing watch, and was unpopular for a large number of years as a relatively undesirable Rolex, and has developed popularity and, and fame which is regularly discussed nowadays. The Speedmaster, which has been released now, is quite an interesting piece because it's a sort of halo model for the Speedmaster range. Now, we all know the Speedmaster Professional, um, as well as the first Omega in space. Both of these are very popular models, both are manually wound, and both currently use the 1861 caliber from Omega, which is uh, relatively distantly related to their, their movements from the 60s, I mean, in the form of the caliber 321, which is, has, has, has developed a cult status as this column wheel operated movement, which was a marvel for its day, an extremely accurate movement, and a phenomenally well-made one too. But in recent years, with the, the, the obsession with vintage watches, which in some ways Omega predicted when they started uh, celebrating their history, um, as they rightly should, for being the, the watch worn on the moon in the, in the 90s, we're now seeing this revival of these vintage calibers, and so Omega has relaunched, as of about a year now since the first announcement, the 321 caliber, not to be produced as a limited edition, but to be produced as a, um, a, a, a small run of watches each year. And this is the first steel watch we've seen to be released with this movement. Now, this comes at the same time as Omega is releasing coaxial versions of this, this style of manually wound chronograph movement as well, as the 3861. So we're seeing two divergent families, but Omega has made very clear that with this 321, they want it to be something special. And so they've recently released the Speedmaster Caliber 321 Ed White, as it's now been known, because it's a remake, almost perfectly in fact, of the SD105.003 released in the mid-60s, which happened to be the first Speedmaster worn outside the capsule in space by the astronaut Ed White, and I believe was also worn um, at his death, a very famous and tragic death, during a fire um, for Apollo 1 at the start of that program. So it's an important watch historically within the, the 60s times, um, the, the heyday, you could say, of NASA's space missions. But this new watch is a, a virtually perfect remake of that piece, with a 39.7mm steel case and, uh, and the domed crystal, as well as the straight lugs seen on early Speedmasters, and this is a beautiful design, and one which I'm sure will be extremely popular. But what's most important about this watch, perhaps, is the fact that it's priced at 13,000 Swiss francs, yet it isn't a limited edition, which is something surprising for the Speedmaster range, because it seems that this non-limited edition is in many ways more special than the limited editions Omega has released in recent months. But at this price, as a regular retail price, it's undoubtedly been the case that many people have been questioning whether this is a competitor to the Rolex Daytona, or is intended to be one. I think this is a fascinating question. 
And the current Rolex Daytona, which people are usually referring to, is the steel version, so the 116500 which has a regular retail price of £10,500, so it's in the same ballpark as the 13,000 francs of the Speedmaster. And the Cosmograph Daytona is, is a watch which is very different. It has a very different public image. It doesn't have this necessary association with, um, with a particular sort of field. Now, of course, Rolex is known for their work um, at Le Mans, for example, and with Formula One. However, most people who buy a Daytona, as far as I can tell, buy Daytona for the sake of it being essentially the ultimate Rolex where complications are concerned. Now, of course, there are, there are watches um, which, uh, which are more complex within the Rolex line from a mechanical perspective, but really the steel chronograph from Rolex is it's the ultimate sports watch, it's the ultimate man's watch in many ways. And the price now that these are going for because of this craze for steel watches and the fact that it's estimated, and this is an estimate because uh, there aren't any figures from Rolex themselves, there are about 20,000 of these steel models being released or produced each year. They're currently selling, whether new or used, on the secondary market for 20 to 25,000 pounds, which is an enormous amount for a steel watch of this sort. But it is, in many ways, the most approachable um, and most universally accepted chronograph there is, if you look at the, the public appreciation for it. It's a 40 millimeter watch. It's extremely wearable. It's a very comfortable watch to wear. And it's finished fantastically well. It's an industrial watch, which is produced to, to an industrial tolerance, and for a mechanical watch, that's extremely high praise. And there is some um, some truly uh, handmade craft which does go into a Daytona. Don't get me wrong, but it's a watch which can be produced industrially. It can be produced in a in a, a way which um, is efficient and is is regular. These are watches which come off the production line um, or come out of Rolex with perfect care, attention to detail, and p perfect regularity. And the movement inside these watches rep represents the same sort of approach. It's the perfect chronograph movement for someone who doesn't want to have to worry about what goes into it, but is also incredibly interesting for someone who does like the insides of watches. Um, it's the Caliber 4130, which is the in-house chronograph movement from Rolex, with a 72-hour power reserve. It has the vertical clutch, clutch and column wheel, which we so appreciate but these are functions to just make it a better chronograph rather than functions to appeal to the watch enthusiast first and foremost. But perhaps most important to the appeal of the Daytona is the fact that it is fundamentally the only luxury watch you could ever need in terms of, of its widespread appeal, it's infinitely recognisable, but also it's a watch which you can wear anywhere, it doesn't really matter that it's conceived for racing, with its ceramic bezel which looks extremely modern, its very beautifully executed dial, but a dial which isn't as sparse or as as, uh, as pure as the, the Speedmaster's dial, in the sense that it doesn't present uh, details uh, for the sake of necessity, but it does embellish them somewhat without compromising legibility. And these are two very different things, because this is a watch which you could wear to a formal event as easily as you could wear it racing or on the golf course. Um, it's that kind of watch, and with 100 meter water resistance, automatic winding, and uh, an extremely reliable movement, in many ways it's the perfect chronograph, um, and you wouldn't really have to spend more for a dress chronograph, for instance, because quite frankly you can wear it now for dress occasions. It's become totally acceptable to wear a sports watch uh, to a black tie event. So one does have this interesting situation where perhaps it's not surprising that Rolex has done so well with this most recent iteration of the Daytona. In this context, with such similar prices, but with vastly different approaches to watchmaking and presenting the chronograph, one would think these watches would, wouldn't would make the most obvious comparisons, but in truth, a lot of people who have been comparing these pieces, or suggesting that Omega's trying to get a piece of Rolex's market, have more of a point than one might immediately think when one looks at the specifications of the new Speedmaster. Whilst this watch has inferior water resistance to the Daytona, it has an exhibition case back, a sapphire crystal, and also an attention to detail on the dial which is very much comparable to that of a Rolex, it's certainly a step up from certainly what we've seen in press material to what normal Speedmasters are, and the detailing such as the curved hands and the levels of the dial really are stepping up to a new level of quality. It also has a ceramic bezel concealed in the form of a dot over 90 bezel, which was seen on those 60s, uh, those original 60s Speedmasters, but here offered in ceramic. And so when presented in this particular format, it becomes quite apparent that Omega have looked at how their track record has gone, 
in the sense that in the past they've released the 1957 Speedmaster, which is perhaps the closest equivalent to this new model. Now that went the whole hog with the vintage side of things, in the sense that it had a, a, a plexiglass crystal, a, a Hesalite crystal rather. It had a, a, very, um, a very distinct look, which was a, a near-perfect recreation of those original 50s Speedmasters, including the, the brushed steel bezel, for example. And with that piece, the competitor, the most clear competitor to that watch, was the Zenith El Primero, certainly in terms of price, um, and also in terms of intentions. And Omega saw that they did extremely well against that kind of competition, so it makes perfect sense they would release something even more special, which used a similar approach of not being a limited edition, but being a limited production, which is exactly the way Rolex have become so, uh, so sought after with the Daytona. So we do see parallels with the Daytona and areas where Omega really has levelled themselves at Rolex, or at least at a similar kind of market. But whilst Omega is certainly directing itself at a similar market for a premium chronograph and for something above their normal Speedmaster range, we do have some distinctions. On the one hand, the Daytona is a very, very modern watch. However, the Speedmaster, perhaps as a result of the support for more, more vintage watches these days, and also the, the readership of, of online magazines praising um, vintage mechanisms and movements uh, growing so enormously, we see that Omega is directing a different product at the same price range, which is perhaps a, a more suitable way of putting it. Because this is a watch which perhaps has to keep up with the Daytona from a technological perspective because of the price it's asking for. However, in reality, it's actually a very different product. The Daytona is the best of modern watchmaking. It's the, the perfect mechanical watch you don't have to worry about. And it's a watch where you could quite, quite simply not think about the movement at all throughout your entire ownership of the watch. By contrast, the Speedmaster is quite a different beast. It's a watch where you have to engage with the movement if you want to enjoy wearing it. It's a manually wound watch. The fact is that uh, probably every morning, it has a 55 hour power reserve, it has to be said, so you could do it every two days. But most days you're going to pick the watch up and wind it, and by so doing hold it in your hand and gaze through the exhibition case back at the beautifully gilt movement which really is a stunning piece with some elements in German, uh, German silver to give that, um, that slightly patinated effect, which is quite wonderful. And so it is a stunning movement to look at, and one which isn't trying to hide the fact that it's not the last word in technology. Um, of course, they did scan an original 321 to be able to create this movement, and through doing so they've created an artefact, something of the past, um, and something which runs in a very traditional way too, as of course one knows from the manually wound side to this watch, but also the fact that it only runs at 18,000 vibrations per hour. So that's five ticks per second to the Rolex's eight, or even Zenith El Primero's um, uh, ten, which does put it in context in terms of being something more simple, more traditional. But whoever buys this realises that, and is buying it with that understanding. So perhaps looking at this as a competitor for the Daytona, or, or, as, or as Omega's alternative, is the wrong way of looking at it. Instead, what this watch is, it seems, is an alternative for someone who enjoys mechanical watchmaking, who enjoys something more than the Daytona, to give them something else to think about at this price range, rather than being something to poach the customers of the Daytona, um, of which there are enormous numbers, it's a phenomenal watch, but this is a different product for a different audience, and a different generation, too, of watch lovers. It also seems that Omega is piling on one additional aspect, which is the fact that whereas the Daytona is to all intents and purposes, uh, a, um, uh, an industrially produced watch in terms of numbers um, and in terms of the, the way Rolex are created with this absolute, um, uh, this setup to be absolutely produced within a set of parameters. Um, the watchmaker doesn't influence how well the watch will work because the movement is designed to work perfectly anyway by design, which is contrary to manufacture style watchmaking, which, which is the, the traditional approach where a movement is, is regulated and made to work, so to speak, by the watchmaker. So what we have here is a watch from, from, from Omega as the Speedmaster, where it keeps up with the, the Daytona on a technological level, where you think about the bezel, the water resistance, and the fit and finish, but this is a handmade watch in terms of the movement. Um, and, um, of course, make no mistake, Omega is, is an equally large brand, and one producing vast numbers of watches. But they've made the point of saying this movement has a large amount of uh, handwork within it.
which just adds another element to appeal to the modern customer of these watches. So in many ways we see two different approaches to producing a Halo watch, one which aspires to bring in some high horology, the other which just tries to make the ultimate consumer watch. But tell me what you think of these watches, because I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about the Speedmaster by comparison to the Daytona. Certainly it has this vintage side, whether you look at the age luminova on the dial, or the movement, it's a very different animal. But I'd be very curious to hear nonetheless what you think of these two watches, and how they compare on paper, but also from a more subjective perspective. So thank you very much for listening, and if you're on YouTube then remember to like, share and subscribe to see more here in future. And also remember that this is available on Spotify and SoundCloud if you want to listen to the podcast in its standard way. This is Armand from WatchCondor.com, out.